Good evening to you all, and uh, a very warm welcome to you, um, those in the building, of course, and also those who are joining us online. We're delighted you're able to join us in this way, um, whether live streaming right now or catching up at some point through the week. Uh, we're delighted to have you joining us online too. We do look forward to evening worship, and um, delighted that um, Alex Hanna is back again this evening, as he was this morning. Um, our minister, Jerry Middleton, is on holiday this week. Um, Alex, for those of you who don't know him, um, serves with UCCF, the Universities and Colleges Christian Fellowship, and he's the staff worker for the North of Scotland, which basically means he is supporting the Christian unions um, in the universities and colleges of this area. And we were greatly blessed by his ministry this morning, and we look forward to God's word through Alex again this evening. Um, perhaps you've noticed on the slides in advance there, the title for tonight's message, Do the Word, looking at uh, a chapter in the book of James. So we very much look forward to thinking about the implication of that for our own practical daily lives. Well, let's begin our worship. Uh, let's sing the opening hymn, uh, Jesus, the Everlasting Word.
Well, let's uh, bow together in prayer just now, shall we? Father, we want to thank you this evening as we gather together just for the privilege of being together. The privilege of quite freely gathering in your house on the eve of your day to worship you. Father, it is a privilege and we thank you for that. And we thank you for one another with whom we're gathered. We thank you for the bonds which unite us together in our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we do seek to worship him tonight as we gather. And uh, thank you that he is the everlasting word, the Father's only Son. Um, we ponder every way in which you have revealed yourself to us. Um, we thank you, yes, for the beauty of these um, late spring, early summer days, the warmth that we've appreciated, at least some days, all reminding us of the warmth of your love to us. We thank you for the beauty of the world around us, the beauty of creation, of new life and growth that is so evident, the beauty of the hills, the beauty of all you've made around us. We bless you for that revelation of yourself. We bless you too for your written word, your written word through which you've revealed yourself, your written word that uh, guards and guides us, your written word that teaches and trains us, your written word that rebukes and corrects us. And uh, thank you, Father, that we have your word as our guidebook. Um, where would we be without it? Um, drifting along um, in um, randomness. We, we bless you that as we gather, we have your word on which to base our lives. So we thank you, Father, yes, for your revealing yourself in creation, for revealing yourself in your written word, but above all, for revealing yourself in the everlasting word, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we bless you for him, the Father's only Son, the Lamb of God, who is indeed worthy to be adored, as we have been singing. Worthy is a lamb who is slain. And we bless you for that death on the cross through which we are rescued from our sin and deadness. We bless you for that resurrection that assures us of life that will never end. We bless you, Father, for him, our Savior, and the way that he will walk with us and talk with us all through our current everyday lives. So we bless you for the everlasting word and help us, Father, to focus on him tonight, to give him the praise and glory for our time together and to learn to love him and serve him better as a result of our gathering. We give our evening to you, Father, and uh, ask you that you'd be honored in it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to turn to the scriptures now. Um, Esther is going to come and read from James chapter 1, starting at verse 19. And uh, over to you, Esther. As Mike said, James chapter 1, starting at verse 19. If you have a church Bible, we're on page 1213, James chapter 1. Entitled Listening and Doing, from verse 19, my dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and, after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. If anyone considers himself religious, and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. 
religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Amen. Um, thank you, Esther. Um, today is Pentecost Sunday, and uh, it's therefore not inappropriate that the hymn we're going to sing next is Holy Spirit, living breath of God, breathe new life into my willing soul. Father, as uh, Alex comes to bring your word to us in just a moment, we would just pause to ask that your life-giving spirit would dwell amongst us in this next while, um, inspiring Alex as we believe uh, you have done in his preparation, but inspiring him and helping him in his delivery of your word, and also helping each of us in the congregation to listen to what you would say to each one of us tonight. Um, speak that particular word, Father, to us. Make our ears open and our hearts ready to receive it and obey it, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good evening, and thank you again for um, having me back, and lovely to see you. For the next two weeks in the evening service, so tonight and for next week, we'll be looking in the book of James. And depending on who you are, depending on how long you've been a Christian, I reckon that will determine how you feel about that prospect. If you're new to the Christian faith, you may not know much about the letter of James. It's a short book. It's near the end of the New Testament. It's buried between Hebrews and 1 Peter, and it might be something that you've not come across yet. Maybe you're an older Christian and you have, you have some strong views on James. Either it's a book that you love to come to or it's a book that you tend to avoid. This is nothing new 
the book of James has been polarizing people for centuries. Maybe it is that if you're less brilliant, you'll gravitate towards Romans. You love the logical layout. Whereas if you're right brained, you love the imagery, the illustrations, the, the wording of James. Well, if you are feeling polarized about the letter of James, you're, you're not alone. The great reformer, Martin Luther, had very strong opinions on the book of James. He called it an epistle of straw. He said epistles like Romans, they're ones of bricks. But here is an epistle of straw. He then went on to say that James had nothing of the nature of the gospel about it. Well, I disagree with Martin Luther, um, but it's a good question to ask. Where are you coming from as we come to James this evening? What's been your experience? For me, I think I was first introduced to the letter as a student when in the CU we were deciding what we were going to study in our main meetings for the following year. And the majority rule of the committee decided that the book of James was to be it. It's just such a practical book. That was the driving factor for the decision. Another committee member called it the Proverbs of the New Testament. And as we studied it, I found James to be less of an instructor in practicalities and more of a demanding head teacher who, who, lays, out, who lays out his rules. In high school, um, I had a head teacher called Mr. McVeigh. He was judge, jury, and executioner when it came to the school rules. He used to walk around with a ruler in his top pocket, and he would call, take it out. And he would measure the length of your hair. If it was under two millimeters, you were sent home. If it was below your shoulders, you were sent home. If your tie wasn't at the right length, if you weren't wearing your black or gray socks, if you were chewing gum, or if you broke any of the other 33 rules that he had written out, you were sent home with a copy of those school rules and you had to handwrite them out to bring them in the next day where he would look at them, throw them in the bin and you knew he was just waiting to catch you again. And for me, that's what it felt like James was. He was giving rules, rules that I tried to keep, but I couldn't. And so I'd go back, I'd go back to the letter and repeat that cycle of trying to keep the rules, but finding out that actually I can't. In fact, the first ever talk I gave was from James, and I find myself setting up the trap for others that I find myself in so often. Here is a list of rules that you need to follow, or else. Now I tell you all this because it's important that we get our bearings in James and what is going on here, otherwise we can fall into the same trap that we can all leave here thinking that there's a bunch of rules that we need to follow or else. I'm very glad to admit that I had got James wrong and I, I am indebted to the teaching of Andy Gemmel at Cornhill down in Glasgow um, and more recently to David Gibson for their teaching and correction because James is not a head teacher just handing out rules willy nilly, just waiting to catch you out. No, he's not a head teacher. Rather, he is the doctor. He is a doctor who is identifying the symptoms, a doctor who gives us a much needed diagnosis. The letter of James, it's not just a collection of practical instructions for Christians of all time. It rather, it's a letter written to a specific group of churches at a specific time for a specific purpose. And it's written to Christians, a group of churches who were behaving very, very badly. They were not thinking the right things about each other. They were not speaking the right things to each other. They were not doing the right things when it came to each other. We don't have time to explore the whole letter to, to see these, um, but James calls them out, calls out these um, believers and points out the symptoms of a much bigger problem. These believers haven't noticed the symptoms or if they have, they, they think little about them. But James, like a good doctor, he's able to identify those symptoms. But not just treat the symptoms, but work out the underlying cause. He invites them into the surgery and delivers the diagnosis. And it's a diagnosis that runs through the entirety of the letter. It's one of double-mindedness. Double-mindedness. And it's a disease that is deadly. 
because we were created to love the Lord our God with all our heart and all our mind and our strength and our soul. But yet we find that we have split allegiances. We find that we have a divided heart. We find that we have a foot in the camp of God and the other in the world. From our mouths, we can praise God in one sentence and yet curse a brother or sister in the next. We are double-minded creatures. And where James is being taught as a list of symptoms to manage, as just a list of rules to follow and obey, well, we'll never get to the heart of the issue. And the issue of the heart is that it is divided. That's the diagnosis, diagnosis that Dr. James gives us. And as you read through this letter, as you read through its pictures, you will allow James to examine, as you allow James to examine you, it can be an incredibly painful examination. But it's a necessary one in order to get the diagnosis, to get, figure out the underlying cause of this double-mindedness and that it's sin. And if you want to treat if you want to stop the disease, you need to treat the underlying condition. And, God, and James gives us a referral to God himself, the great physician. And he tells us that the medicine we need is God's grace. And so with our passage tonight, we enter the surgery and we present our symptoms. We knock on the door, we walk in and we say to James, I love God, but I also have a tongue that is used to hurt people, hurt his people. I love scripture, but I also want and love a life of comfort. We come with a split personality, don't we? One which loves and wants to serve God and to be obedient to the Lord Jesus. And the other side, which is in love with the world, is disobedient and is in wrong relation to God's people. And in our passage tonight, James speaks to us first and foremost as dear brothers and sisters. This isn't writing to people on the outside. He's writing to people in the church. And he writes up a prescription, a cure, a way to be made whole, a way to fuse back that division of the heart, a way to be made one. And it's here in verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Don't just listen to the word. Do what it says. Do the word. It's that simple. That's what James says. The Bible that is in front of you, whether on paper, in, on paper or on your phone, he's saying, read it, listen to it, take note of it, and then do it. Just do it, and you will be whole. We're not talking about tweaking a few things, or some things here and there, but he's saying that the whole person living in line with what God has said. That's the solution, that's the cure. It's not easy, but it's also not complicated. In the same way that a doctor might tell us that the treatment is to lose weight or to stop smoking. Here, it is do the word. If you want to be cured, if you want what is an offer in verse 20, what is that the righteousness that God desires? then you need to do the word. And tonight we'll learn three things about the word which James reveals to us, and then we'll think about how this can help us in our desires to be whole. So first of all, the Bible is the implanted word of God. That's verses 19 to 22. The Bible is the implanted word. Verse 19, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Now, there are times when the body desperately needs an implant to save it, a stent to keep an artery open, a, a pacemaker to control the rhythm of the heart, a plate and pins to help fuse a bone back together, and here James is saying, in verse 21, stop doing that stuff, that moral filth, that evil that is so prevalent, and instead receive this implant, 
receive the gospel word. It can save you. It is the gospel word that will save you. Jesus is Lord and rescuer, and it is this gospel word, this gospel word that we see him, that we meet him, and that is the route to the rescue. As you received that message at the start of your Christian life, as the word was planted in you, in the good soil of your heart, carry on receiving it humbly. The way in is the way on. Continue to receive this gospel word. Receive the word humbly. But also know that you need to put the other stuff away. That stuff that is totally out of line with the lordship of Jesus. So much so that if you are claiming to have received this word and still living in that way, still treating and speaking about your brothers and sisters in that way, then James has some harsh words for us. In verse 22, he says, then you really are deceiving yourself. If you claim to receive this word and still living in that way, then you really are deceiving yourself. And I think verse 19 is talking about the word of God rather than a general principle. In verse 20, human anger doesn't lead to the righteousness of God. And so if you want to be like God, well, you need to put away that behavior and instead humbly receive his word, the word of God. And how do you know if that word has taken root? How do you know if it's taken root in your heart? Well, it'll look like an obedient life. It will look like an obedient life. Now we need to pause here and address those of us with more sensitive consciences. Those of us who can read it and within seconds can point to the many, many ways where there are discrepancies in our lives. Discrepancy between the gospel message and our obedience to it. It is very easy to beat yourself silly with verse 22. And if that is you here this evening, then I want to say that we need to remember the context. This is not James demanding perfection. He knows that that's not going to happen. This isn't written to the Christian who tries to be obedient and fails. Because that is just the normal experience of being a Christian. And it will be until the last day of your life. This isn't written to that humble Christian who recognizes his or her inconsistencies, but rather it is written to proud Christians, those who refuse to be humbled, those whose consciences are never moved, those who refuse to accept the implanted word with meekness, those who are continuing to speak, think, and treat one another in this gross behavior that James lays out in his letter, those who think of themselves as people who are hearing the gospel properly, but with no evidence in their lives whatsoever. And it's to them that James is writing verse 22. You think that just because you have your Bible open that you're okay? Look at your behavior. You are fooling. You're only fooling yourselves. You're deceiving yourselves. You now, these people are displayed in the illustration of verse 23. That's who James is speaking to here. Verse 23, and it's the second picture of the Bible that James presents us. Secondly, verse 23 and 24, the Bible is a revealing mirror. The Bible is a revealing mirror. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror. And after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Imagine, if you will, a man who gets up in the morning. He's been out the night before. He's stayed out late. He's celebrated. He's kept home late, crawled into bed. The next morning, the alarm goes off. He awakes from a slumber. He goes into the bathroom, and he looks in the mirror. And as he looks in the mirror, as he studies himself intently, he realizes very quickly that he has dirt all over his face from the night before. His five o'clock shadow is now an eclipse. His hair is messy and greasy with bits sticking all over the place. His eyebrows have some of those really weird, long, isolated hairs. And to top it all off, he has a massive spot at the end of his nose. And as he starts the rest of his day, 
He goes through his wardrobe, he puts on his clothes, he walks a dog, he sits down, he, eats the, he reads the paper, he eats some toast, and then he leaves for work. But his face is still dirty, his hair is still greasy. He looked into the mirror, he saw all the things that he needed to do, and he didn't do them. He didn't shave, he didn't wash his face, he didn't clean his hair, and he didn't pop the zit. Last Wednesday, on the way to my home group, I was a bit late in eating my dinner. I had to scoff most of it down before jumping in the car. And as I sat in traffic, I glanced at myself in the rearview mirror and saw that I had pasta stains all over my mouth. Well, what did I do? Well, it's what all of us would do, isn't it? I grabbed a napkin and I scrubbed my face until those orange stains were gone. Who looks in the mirror, who sees that action is needed and does nothing? That man who got up, who saw all these things that needed to be fixed and walked away and forgot about them, well, he might as well have never looked in the mirror in the first place. And James is saying that's exactly what these badly behaved Christians are doing. They see themselves in the mirror and they're taking no action. They are listening to the word of God and they are doing nothing. He is pointing out their stupid behavior for how absurd it is. What kind of self-deception is going on when people who call themselves gospel believers behave with carelessness, pride, and malice towards one another? Well, unlike the man in the mirror, you don't need to imagine it. It's the type of ludicrous behavior that is going on in these churches. And perhaps we don't need to try too hard to imagine it ourselves. The word of God is a revealing mirror. What will we do as we look into it? as we see all the things that we need to change. Well, hopefully it's what we see in verse 25, and that's our third point. Thirdly, the Bible is a freeing law. Verse 25, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. James has given the Bible another name here, the the perfect law. In the ESV, he calls it the perfect law, the law of liberty, giving it a double new name. And he's saying that when you look intently in the Bible, when you listen to it, and then you go and do it, well, you're not just seeing yourself revealed as in a mirror, but you're also seeing God revealed. You're seeing him face to face. You see who he is. You see his character, his loves, his desires, his standards, his law. That's what a law does. It reveals the nature of the one who gives it. In North Korea, a quick Google search told me that it is illegal to wear jeans. Denim jeans are illegal as it's considered a symbol of capitalism. It is illegal to listen to foreign music. It's illegal to watch films in a foreign language. And for some reason, it's illegal to own a microwave. They're ridiculous totalitarian laws, aren't they? But they reveal a lot about the leader of North Korea. But God's laws are the opposite. They are perfect. Perfect laws given by a perfect God. And these laws, his law, gives freedom. Now that can seem like an oxymoron. How can a law be freeing? Aren't laws there to restrict freedom? Well, if a law is perfect, then the only way to be free is to live within it. A fish belongs in water due to the law of nature. But it also brings freedom as it sets the fish free to live in accordance with its nature. It's not very freeing for that fish to live on land. And when God gives us his law, as he tells us what to do and what not to do, it's in line with both his nature and ours. And it reminds us that we were created for our flourishing, that those laws were created for our flourishing as creatures of the good and perfect creator. And so what is our response to be when we're confronted with this perfect law, this law of liberty? Well, verse 25, we are to do it. And in doing so, we become blessed in all we do. The law of the Lord is not restricting. Rather, doing it makes you flourish. It will make you content. It will make you whole. It will make you righteous. 
And so if that is what the Bible is, if it is the implanted word, if it is the revealing mirror, if it is the freeing law, then what is the response? What is the response? Well, James asks the questions, asks these questions to his audience. If God's word, the gospel, is truly working in you, well, it'll, it will manifest in these ways. And in doing so, he raises the question of whether it's manifesting in these ways in us. Are you truly religious? That's his question. Well, here are two tests. First of all, what do you say? Are you truly religious? Well, what do you say? The topic of speech is a common theme in the letter of James. And it's an area where these church members have gotten it very, very wrong. Verse 26, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Again, we see that self-deception. What do you say? Or what do you say to or about others? Probably more accurate. And what does that say about your religion? Well, Andy Gemmel said that it is a particular mark of our sinfulness that we are able to claim knowledge of God and yet go on to speak about people made in his image. Speak about people made in his image in ways which, if someone were to hear us, they would be perfectly justified in saying, you don't really know God. Aren't those words cutting? Have you ever had someone say something like that to you? Do you really know God? If you do, then why are you saying that? It's one of the most cutting things that you can say to someone, isn't it? And yet it only goes to highlight the point that James will make later in this letter. The tongue is incredibly powerful, but it is also incredibly, incredibly dangerous. The tongue can cause great damage. And so Christian, how are you using it? Because it's easy to do all the culturally acceptable things and agree on certain doctrines. But yet do we underestimate the impact a quiet word here and there might have? A piece of gossip passed off, even as a prayer request? The group of people who consider themselves spiritual, talking about the group that they think are not. If anyone thinks of themselves as religious but cannot tame the tongue, their religion is worthless. When your speech is relationally destructive, when it's used to benefit you, used to tear others down, then it reveals something about our gospel reception and whether or not the word of God has been truly planted in our hearts. Verse 26, it's worthless, says James. We can measure our religion by our orthodoxy, that's what we're tempted to do. Which church we're in, what denomination we're part of, who our pastor is, how we spend our money, how we use our time. But James says, no, I'll tell you the worth of your religion just let me listen to your words. Just let me listen to your words. Don't show me the Bible app open on your phone. Show me the messages that you've sent. Show me the emails in your outbox. That will reveal how worthy your religion is. What do you say? And secondly, are you religious? Well, who will you serve? Verse 27, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Who will you invest in? That's the next question. And here's an example of people who by the world's term will give very, will give very little award, if any. Widows and orphans have very little to offer. But in the Bible, it is characteristic that God is the one who cares for the widow, who cares for the orphan. He is the one who looks after the ones who are unable to look after themselves. He shows no favoritism. He loves all that he has made, but human beings, however, well, we're very different, aren't we? 
We often look to those from whom we can gain something. The ones whom we can call in a favor in the future. The ones whose approval we value. The one who we can name drop so others know that we're rubbing shoulders with that person. But praise God that he is not like that. He looks after the ones who don't give much reward. And James says that if you are to be in his family, in God's family, well, you are to be known by family likeness. You are to do the same thing that God does. You are to care for the widows and the orphans. Because the world loves the people who are great in status. But you are to be different. Unstained by that, says James. Rather, you are to love like God loves. You are to pay attention to who he pays attention to. You are to serve the widow and the orphan. It's worth taking a moment to point out that the social welfare action here, that the the going and doing something very practical in the name of God is not in place of the word, is not in competition with the word, but rather it flows from the word. Do you see that? It flows from the word. The great mistake that many churches have made is that they've gone for social action projects at the expense of teaching the Bible. And with no implanted word that is able to save, well, the church dies. We've seen it time and time again. Yes, it is incredibly important to go and to do social action, to practically live out the justice of the gospel, but not at the expense of the word. Rather, they are to go together, the word followed up with action. So, if God's word, the gospel, is truly working on you, James asks, well, then who will you serve? Who are you serving? Now, as we finish, let let me try to tie some things together. And I want to finish on two points First question that each one of us needs to think of tonight is where are we with the Bible? Where are we with the Bible? James's words can cut, can cut like a scalpel. And as we hear them tonight, we, we need to examine where we are with the Bible. Or is our love for the scriptures deepening year upon year? Or is it feeling less implanted? Is it feeling more uprooted than it was this time last year? Again, from Andy Gemmell, he he shared a story of a conversation he had with an older minister, a minister who said that his great fear is that people will come every Sunday and they will nod at the truth. They will put texts beside all the things that they agree with and they'll put crosses beside all the things that they don't and then they will go away. What a terrible thing it would be to get a stage of life, get to a stage of life where the gospel message, where the word of God makes no more demands on me than it already has, to feel like I have completed it, to feel like it is no longer applicable to my life, where I no longer accept or expect God to challenge me or to rebuke me or to humble me or to admonish me. The question we need to ask ourselves is where are we with the Bible? Does the Bible still have that rebuking, life-changing power that it once has. It's easy for us to look at somebody else looking in a mirror and to point out all the things that they need to change, isn't it? But James doesn't doesn't allow that. He's holding up the mirror of the word of God and he tells us to look into it. As uncomfortable as it might be at times, look intently, examine what is going on, and then do something about it. That's the invitation tonight. R.C. Sproul said that there is an inseparable relationship between your affection for Christ and your affection for the scriptures. And we're confronted with the challenge. If my relationship with the Bible has cooled, is it likely that a cooling relationship with Jesus has followed? It's an important question. There's no point doing the word 
if you don't know the word, if you don't love the word, if it has just become a series of checkboxes, well, we're in deep trouble. Where are you with your Bible? Are you doing the word? Because it's doing the word that will draw praises from the one, the one whom we long to serve, the one that causes us to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's the goal, isn't it? Where are you with the Bible? And then finally, take heart. Take heart because the gospel message is a message of hope. Verse 21, therefore get rid of all moral filth and all evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. When I was a student, one of my lectures um, was an endocrinologist, a specialist in, in hormones. And he shared with us a story of how he was at home one night watching the one show. And on the one show, they had an interview with, with a nun, a nun who had a speech impediment. She's had it for years. And he told us that just by looking at her, he was able to diagnose a tumor on a pituitary gland. He rang up the one show. He let them know they got in contact with this nun. She went to the hospital, she got an MRI scan, and she found that she had a massive tumor just at the base of her brain. She was blissfully unaware, but he identified a ticking time bomb. And I can feel like this is what James does for us. We can come to an end of a passage like this and feel completely overwhelmed. Where James has pointed out symptoms that we've potentially not even been aware, been aware of, or if we have been aware of, have played down. And he tells us that it could be signs of a bigger problem. And so we come back to where we began. How do we read James? Well, it's not to go away with a list of things that we need to do to be better. Rather, it is to examine our hearts, examine our lives, examine our speech, but ultimately to find ourselves back at the cross of Christ. James, he's not expecting perfection. It is normal for us to feel inadequate when we read what is expected of us. Why? Because we're fallen humans, reconciled sinners. James doesn't expect you to be able to fix your problem. And the good news is that Christ doesn't expect us to fix it either. What does James do? Well, he looks forward to the end in verse 21, doesn't he? He is saying that the gospel, the word that was planted in you when you first believed, well, that word is able to save you on that last day. And so often we feel like it's impossible, don't we? There is so little, there is too often so little progress in my life. That I'm still struggling with those same sins that I've been struggling with a decade ago. And what James is saying is persevere. Keep putting off filth, keep putting off that evil, keep repenting, keep turning back to God and keep humbly accepting the word planted in you. Repent and receive the word and then do it. And you know what? You'll mess up. But then repent and receive the word and then do it again and again and again and again and persevere. Keep persevering all the while trusting in the word that became flesh so that we can hear on that wonderful final day, well done, my good and faithful servant. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your wonderful word. Although sometimes painful, we thank you that your word is living and active sharper than a two-edged sword, which can cut through bone and sinew. And Lord, some of us may be feeling that tonight, feeling the weight of, of sin, feeling a reality of a divided heart. Lord, we pray that you would help us not to lose heart. 
Help us to keep turning away from sin, to put away all moral filth and evil. And once again, help us to receive the living gospel of the living Lord Christ into our hearts once again. Father, help us not to be like those who look in the mirror and do nothing. Father, help us to look at your perfect law, the law of liberty, and in it find all the freedom that we were created to enjoy as we respond in whole obedience, as we respond by doing your word. Father, we pray that you would help us to bridle our tongues. Father, we realize the damage and the pain that we have caused by our words. And we pray that you would allow us to, to allow our speech, how we relate to one another, how we relate to those around us, to be in line with true obedience to, to, to Christ. Father, we pray that you would allow us to reflect your character to the world around us. Help us to take up those family traits and to care for those who cannot care for themselves. And Father, we pray that you would create in us a fresh and new desire for your word. Father, we pray that as we spend time in your word that you would show us Christ, that you would allow us to grow in our love and our appreciation that from your word would we turn to you in praise and glory giving you all the honor because of what Christ has done for us because what you have done for us through Christ Father we thank you that you do not expect us to be perfect we thank you that that is not uh, a weight that we need to bear but we thank you that we can look to the, your perfect one the word who became flesh, your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, as we serve him, as we delight in him, as we rejoice in what he has done for us, Father, we pray that you'd be using us, using us to, to help plant this word which can save to many in this city. Lord, use us as your sowers of the word. Father, we pray for our mission. We pray for repentance of those in this city. And Father, we pray that you would be using us as we go into this week. Let us not be one thing today and another thing tomorrow. Let us not be double-minded, double-souled, double-hearted. Let there not be a division with one foot in the in your camp and another in the world. But let our whole lives, let our whole lives reflect your goodness and your grace as we share your word, as we go and live and speak for Jesus. Let us not just be a church, your people that, that know your word, but let us go and do your word. And Lord, use us to go and to share your word. We pray this in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. Well, let us respond and close our worship here in this Lord's Day by singing the great missional hymn, Facing a Task Unfinished.
We thank you, our Father, as we go into all the world this coming week, as we go out into the city of Aberdeen, wherever that takes us, um, amongst our neighbours, amongst our friends, amongst our colleagues at work, wherever. Father, we ask you that we might know, be confident that we go not alone, but with you going before us and working in us and through us. Help us then, Father, to trust in you, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.